mankind has long established itself at the top of the food chain. Predators that stalked our ancestors have been relegated to the wilderness that borders civilization. Driven by desperate hunger, these beasts can be as deadly to man as any fable monster. Bloodlust is not just for mankind in these tales of killer animals. A source of fear and superstition, wolves were a mainstay of European folklore by the time much of France had fallen to English invasion in 1427. Paris acted as the nation's foremost trading hub at the time, attracting livestock and causing much of the surrounding trees to be harvested for fuel. With the chaos allowing packs of wolves to decimate herds of sheep and villages in the countryside, it would be these confluence of factors it would ultimately allow the predators to lay siege to Paris itself. At first, travelers along the roads to the city fell victim. It became common knowledge that it was necessary to sacrifice at least one animal to the wolf pack in order to continue safely. One account had three members of the peasant Dubois family transporting their sheep to Paris by cart, only to be attacked and devoured by the pack despite Jean Dubois putting up a fight in a vain attempt to save them. One wolf in particular quickly made its presence known. Known as Cortaud, literally bobtail in French, the alpha of the pack was significantly larger than the rest of the wolves and sported a coat of red fur. Cortaud acquired his moniker after his tail was caught under a closing portocollis while fleeing Paris with only a stub remaining after the rest had been severed. Also displaying an unnatural amount of cunning, Ortaud avoided city walls where guards armed with crossbows were stationed, as well as demonstrating a preternatural sense for dodging traps. Ortaud and his pack first attacked Paris in the early months of 1428 by following a beef herd being delivered to the starving populace. With the city's gates open, the wolves killed several men and cattle while peasants fled to their homes. The gates were shut in an attempt to trap the pack inside and finish them off with arrows, though Cortaud had famously escaped at the cost of his tail. The legend of the Wolf King grew over the coming years, with attempts to quell the wolves by feeding them dead plague victims, only succeeding in giving them an appetite for human flesh. It was the winter of 1439 that the pack was able to enter Paris on a frozen river by sliding under a protective grill, making their way to Notre Dame Cathedral, where they slaughtered 40 members of the clergy, including an archbishop. Incensed, a guard captain named Boisselier hatched a plan. With Paris under quarantine, meat and garbage were piled in Ile de la Cité, and streets leading to the city were partitioned off. Boisselier ordered his men not to shoot or frighten the wolves, hoping to coax them inside. At first, the pack was hesitant, but eventually succumbed to temptation after several days. The gate was shut, trapping them inside. The men of Paris fired arrows and threw stones from elevated positions, leaving many wolves dead or wounded. Gortaud himself managed to take cover under a fountain, along with several members of his pack. Next, a huntsman unleashed his hounds on the surviving wolves, although Gortaud's pack killed them all without taking any losses. Finally, Boisselier and his guardsmen took to the field armed with spears, killing more wolves and sustaining casualties. Gortaud was cornered in the doorway of a church by Boisselier ran him through before the huge wolf used the last of his strength to tear Boisselier's throat. By the time it was over, roughly 150 people and 300 wolves lay dead. It was March of the year 1898. 
in the process of constructing a railway from Uganda to the Indian Ocean, the colonial British hired Indian and African workers to build a train bridge over the Savo River in Kenya. It would be here that dozens of victims would meet their end at the jaws of a pair of vicious predators. John Patterson, the lieutenant colonel overseeing the project, had only arrived on site a few days ago before the first attack took place. A search for a missing porter resulted in the discovery of the man's mutilated body, with subsequent searches turning up corpses from other expeditions. Workers spoke of two mainless male lions entering the camp at night to drag away helpless victims. Attacks continued throughout the month and into April, until 17 men under Patterson's leadership were dead. Defenses were constructed to dissuade the lions, such as campfires and walls, but did not stop them from leaping over or crawling under the partitions. Seeming to exercise caution early on in their attacks, only one of the man-eaters would enter a camp at a time. As frightened workers began to flee the area in droves, the district officer sent to intervene was nearly killed, escaping with claw marks on his back, while his assistant was not so fortunate. The killings would drag on for months as the pair of lions became more brazen. Patterson made several attempts at laying traps and ambushes, but was only finally successful on the 9th of December when he managed to shoot one first in his hind leg and later through its heart. The second lion would prove more resilient when Patterson confronted it three weeks later, having to shoot it nine times with three different rifles. This lion would die gnawing on a branch as it tried to reach Patterson after stalking him. With the Savo man-eaters defeated, the train bridge could finally be completed. Patterson would later sell the lion's skin to the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago for $5,000, where they can be seen today. As for why the pair feed on human prey, one lion was shown to have a malformed jaw that would have affected its ability to hunt, leaving it to target vulnerable humans. In all, 35 men are thought to have perished during the Savo attacks, although Patterson claimed the Lions had taken 135 lives. Of course, a continent as vast as Africa is bound to have several legendary beasts. The Ruzizi River in Burundi is the home of a modern myth named Gustav. Measuring over 20 feet long and weighing in excess of 2,000 pounds, this monstrous Nile crocodile has terrorized the area for decades. The earliest accounts of Gustav date back to 1987. Stories surfaced of a giant crocodile snatching people from the riverbank and dragging them under as they swam, fetched water, or washed clothes. At the time, this region was rife with conflicts that left many dead, and their bodies were disposed of here by the military. Acquiring a taste for human flesh, Gustav eventually went from feeding on humans, if given the opportunity, to actively hunting them, sometimes leaving their corpses uneaten. Numerous attempts were made to capture or kill Gustav. Traps were set, including one with a live goat, but the crocodile proved to be too large and powerful to be contained, and eventually learned to identify and avoid them. Gunshot wounds were visible along his side from attempts to shoot him, but could not penetrate his thick, leathery hide. Gustav also sported scars of unknown origin. These injuries, along with his immense size, may have also influenced Gustav's predations. Lacking the agility to hunt, fish, or gazelle, he sought the larger game, with one report even having him take down a hippopotamus. Although originally believed to be a century old due to his size, herpetologists later estimated he had hatched around 1955, since he still had all his teeth. Sightings of Gustav were sporadic over the years, 
leading many to believe he was an urban legend, if not some kind of demonic creature. Travel Africa magazine published an article in 2019 that claimed he had finally been killed, although provided no evidence and minimal information. If untrue, there may still be a real-life monster responsible for hundreds of deaths lurking in the water of the Ruzizi River. Not all killers are human. With such a vast world to explore, it is important to remember the power of nature. On the other hand, a petting zoo may be a safer bet.